Okay, uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, welcome to the Middle East Strategy Forum. My name is Bijan Ahmadi. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. Our uh, second session for today is titled Arms Race and Terrorism in the Middle East. For this panel, we have Sanam Chantier moderating the discussion. Sanam is a senior journalist with 17 years of experience in the media landscape. She's currently based in Paris, where she hosts and produces France 24's weekly flagship program, Middle East Matters, addressing social, political, economic, and cultural topics across the region. In addition to her work as a journalist, she has uh, become increasingly involved in promoting nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, a cause that she holds extremely close to her heart, uh, having covered Iran's nuclear files since 2008. Sanam also works closely with various international bodies, think tanks, and NGOs on pressing issues, security, peace building, and diplomacy. Thanks, Sanam, for uh, being with us today. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for that kind uh, introduction, Bijan. I'd like to very warmly welcome our panelists, of course, and those of you joining us uh, virtually. Now, before we kick off this discussion on, as it was just mentioned moments ago, arms race and terrorism in the Middle East, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our very esteemed panel of experts and hear their opening remarks. Let's uh, start off with uh, Barbara Slavin, who's a director of the Future of Iran Initiative and a senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. She's also a lecturer in international affairs at the George Washington University. Barbara has also penned several books, including Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, Iran and the US, and the Twisted Path to Confrontation. Barbara, you have the mic for your opening statement. Thank you very much, Sanam, and thank you very much, Bijan, for inviting me. Uh, this is a great conference, and you've had some really wonderful conversations about the region. Um, you know, I was kind of hopeful that we really were at a, a, a moment of change. Obviously, what's been going on in, in Gaza and in Israel uh, has been extremely distressing, but in a in a way, I think it, it re-emphasizes the need for a new path in the Middle East and for a return to diplomacy because, uh, you know, rockets and civilian casualties are obviously not bringing uh, anyone a, a better life or, or showing a, a proper path forward. Um, the United States, I mean, certainly has some continuity and some important change now under the Biden administration. The continuity is that the US wants to get out of the Middle East. And this was the policy of Donald Trump, uh, rather ham-handedly expressed. Uh, he, keep, he kept trying to pull US troops out of Afghanistan. Well, uh, that is happening now. Uh, and uh, Joe Biden says they'll all be out by September 11th and contingency plans are being put into effect to deal with any Al Qaeda or ISIS presence in that country after US forces are, are withdrawn. The second important change of course, is that the US uh, immediately said it wanted to re-engage with Iran, get back into the joint comprehensive plan of action. And that had a bit of a bumpy start, but uh, apparently there has been some progress. There have been four rounds now in Vienna and a number of understandings reached. Uh, so it may not come next week, it may not come before the Iranian elections uh, on June the 18th, but it, it, it looks as though uh, an understanding will be reached and the process will be, will be underway. Uh, and Iran's domestic politics hopefully won't uh, interfere with that. Um, we have some other positive developments that the United States is supporting quietly. The talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia that are going on in Iraq. Uh, for example, um, which have certainly quiet U.S. support, even reports that Bill Burns was in Baghdad, a former diplomat, very senior diplomat with a lot of Middle East experience, who's now the head of the CIA. And he had meetings in Baghdad uh, last month. There were some reports that he might have even met Iranians, um, although those have not been confirmed. Um, these are good developments. Um, even in terms of what's been going on in Gaza and Israel, uh, Joe Biden was very careful at first, very circumspect. He didn't want to embarrass uh, the Israelis, um, but, uh, you know, his, his subtle hints were not being taken. And so he came out uh, yesterday and basically said, that's enough, guys, and uh, you have to call this off. Uh, you have to de-escalate and stop the situation. Um, why is that? Well, it's not because Joe Biden has radically changed his views about Israel. I think he's one of the more 
um, more dedicated uh, supporters of Israel over his very long political career. Uh, but public opinion has changed in the United States, particularly in the Democratic Party, but not just in the Democratic Party. Israel is no longer, you know, the scrappy little upstart that fights uh, all the Arab countries. It's now seen very much as an extremely powerful country that uses disproportionate force against uh, not just its adversaries, but against innocent civilians. And I believe Bernie Sanders has introduced legislation to reconsider US arms sales to Israel, which is not something I ever thought I would live to see. So there are, there are changes that are taking place. The United States, the American people are focused on recovery from COVID, economic recovery, disengagement from forever wars, uh, climate change, uh, building a better future. And, uh, and the Middle East is somehow, you know, it's, it's this quicksand that has always dragged us in for more than 40 years. And people are, are frankly really tired of it. So I think that um, the, the Gaza situation is very unfortunate, but in a way it has reinforced uh, the desire of the Biden administration and of Americans in general to, uh, to find diplomatic ways to, to push forward and to relieve uh, some of the pressures that we've all been under, particularly for the last 20 years, to constantly intervene uh, in the Middle East. So maybe I'll stop there and look forward to questions and comments from my co-panelists. Thank you very much for those uh, insightful uh, remarks, Barbara. Up next, um, today joining us, we have uh, Kehan Barzaga, who's a professor and the chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Azad University in Tehran. He was previously a research fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs and a postdoctoral research fellow at the London School of Economics, LSE. Uh, Kehan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Sanam. I, uh... I appreciate the invitation and I'm glad to share with you some of my views as an Iranian academic. Uh, I think, uh, let me uh, begin by saying that in substance, I think the uh, nature of conflict in the region is based on uh, uh, local characteristic, uh, you know, geographical centrality and historical determination. And it is interesting that in the course of the time, any of these conflicts are adjusting themselves with the field uh, reality, and uh, that's a fact. Uh, and I believe that this is uh, all true about the old, uh, you know, regional conflict in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Gaza, and even in Afghanistan, and dealing with the Taliban. And we uh, we see that in the process, uh, we we kind of uh, seeing uh, that the local forces are getting more capacity, more potentials, more experience of conducting the war, technology of war, how to use, you know, the, uh, the drones uh, and the experience of war to tackle the threats or, uh, you know, fighting with uh, uh, opposition factors or foreign, uh, uh, you know, uh, states. Uh, this, in my belief, will complicate the uh, nature of any conflict in the region. And I believe that uh, you know, uh, getting to any uh, uh, sustainable peace and security and stability requires a kind of regional and extra regional cooperation. And this is very important to understand that how much, for instance, the experience of the Houthi in Yemen with uh, the drone attacks with Saudi Arabia changed the entire you know, balance of equation and power with uh, relations with Saudi Arabia or Hezbollah in, in Lebanon or, or, or Hash al Shabi in Iraq uh, or even the Taliban that the American are talking with them. You know, this is the field reality that America is, uh, is uh, in the process of conducting talks with a group that used to be, uh, you know, called a terrorist uh, group. And that is very significant right now. And I, I think that uh, this is very important that how much we conduct the regional cooperation as soon as possible. In this context, and I think that the good news is that Iran and Saudi Arabia are conducting talks. Uh, I believe that Iran will welcome any bilateral and regional, uh, you know, uh, cooperation talks in this regard. Of course, it is important that uh, this will not be confined in the uh, case of Yemen, for instance, because Iran believes that 
uh, the regional security is interlinked and it should be comprehensive. So uh, for Iran, it is a matter of confidence building from the beginning, and then it, go, it can go to the other issues. Uh, but the good news is that they are talking right now and that the Americans are supporting this talk. This is good news. And I hope that the two sides could go ahead with that. That will bring, you know, positive impacts on the regional stability. And, and I think that this is very much important. My last point is that uh, right now we are uh, having the, uh, the nuclear negotiations uh, in Vienna. I hope that the, uh, the, uh, the Western sides uh, are not going to uh, make the same mistake by packaging the uh, you know, uh, nuclear negotiations with the other regional and missiles issues because, because this is a wrong assumptions that has uh, from the beginning was uh, based on an inaccurate assumption and you know, assessment of Iran's policy. I think uh, the, uh, the success of the nuclear uh, negotiation will bring about you know, regional talk naturally. And there is no need to emphasize on that if we try to somehow package uh, uh, you know, this uh, trifold of you know, nuclear issue, regional issue and missile issue together, we will kill you know, the entire talk from the beginning because Iran has the geopolitical superiority and it is the strength of Iran to go to the, uh, to the regional talks. So uh, we should change the methodology of thinking. We remember that in the time of the Trump, the maximum pressure policy brought about, you know, maximum presence policy by the Iran side. And this is because of the fact that Iran feels strategically insecure from the US presence and its allies policy in the region. So we, we need to change the methodology and it will work. I stop here and I, uh, I look forward for a uh, you know, Q&A section. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Kehan. Um, that was a uh, really interesting. Uh, up next, we have uh, Dania Thafer, the executive director of Gulf mm -hmm. International Forum. She's also a lecturer at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. Dr. Thafer has co-authored two books, uh, The Arms Trade Military Services and the Security Market in the Gulf States, Trends and Implications, and The Dilemma of Security and Defense in the Gulf Region. Dr. Thafer, please go ahead uh, with your opening statement. Thank you, uh, Sanam, for the introduction, and thank you, Bijan, Bijan for the invitation. Um, I will just be giving a broad overview of the geopolitical situation um, in regard to the Arab Gulf states as it pertains to the current state of the region and the arms race. Um, so talks may be uh, underway between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but in my opinion, uh, the negotiation between the two parties has really started uh, years ago. After the US's unilateral uh, withdrawal from the JCPOA, uh, there was not only a maximalist Trump policy applied to Iran, there was a region-wide maximalist policy uh, led by Saudi Arabia and the UAE in attempt to grab the most power and leverage as possible um, before they enter any phase of reconciliation. Unsurprisingly, uh, during this period, uh, there was a surge in armament, according to the uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, Middle Eastern arm imports increased 25% um, between 2016 and 2020. And this is mainly due to regional competition between the Gulf states. Um, in this period, Saudi Arabia increased its imports by 61% and Qatar with a whopping 361% um, when compared to the, what you would call the Arab Spring period um, between 2011 and 2015. And uh, the change in Washington coupled with the devastating effects of COVID-19 caused both Riyadh and Abu Dhabi to recognize that the time of resistance is over and there is a willingness among the GCC countries to work towards uh, de-escalation and negotiation. And this is evident by uh, the al ula agreement, the recent talks with Iran um, and the attempts to resolve the Yemen war. It is likely uh, that this path towards reconciliation will continue among the GCC states and Iran. 
and is likely not exception, and, and I'm sorry, Iran is likely not an exception um, to this rule. Uh, today, the balance in the Gulf region has really tipped, as I emphasized, towards a reconciliation between Iran and the GCC states. And this is more than it has in recent history. Uh, the hardy strategic alliance uh, characteristic of the last four years between the UAE and Saudi Arabia has really narrowed autonomy of other GCC nations and left the smaller states uh, looking for regional security so solutions, diluting their general viewpoint of Iran being the primary threat. I'm not saying that Iran is not considered a threat, but it's not the primary one for in, in the view of many of the GCC states. Well, ironically, at the same time, um, the gradual decreased role of the US in the Gulf raised uh, the threat perception of Iran for Saudi, Bahrain, and the UAE. With the Biden administration in office and Qatar developing amicable relations with Iran, the gap in the power differentiation between those who are confrontational with Iran and those that are proponents of engagement with, with Iran has narrowed. Um, as we all know, Qatar has amicable relations with Iran due to the blockade. Kuwait has decent relations with Iran. UAE has reached out to Iran and has a sizable economic interest vested with Iran, although there's deep distrust between both countries. And there is no question that Oman has excellent relations with Iran. This leaves only Saudi and Bahrain as the only two states that have fully confrontational uh, relations with Iran. Therefore, it is likely that we will continue to see more engagement and willingness uh, to talk to, to Iran. So what does this mean for the arms race in the Gulf? Well, the conclusion is still unclear. On the one hand, um, naturally, as the region moved towards more de-escalation, I foresee a slow down in the arms race. On the other hand, as the US decreases its role in the region, I foresee states attempting to diversify their alliance perhaps buying weapons from Europe, China, and Russia, um, investing in their own defense and deterrent structures, focusing on more militarization and weaponization. For example, the UAE is buying the F-35 and establishing uh, regional security arrangements. For example, the UAE's normalization with Israel and Bahrain or Qatar's strategic alliance uh, with Turkey. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Safer. Um, last but not least, we have Dr. Luciano Zakaran, Assistant Professor in Gulf Politics at the Qatar University. He's also Visiting Assistant Professor at the Georgetown University in Qatar and Director of the Observatory on Politics and Elections in the Arab and Muslim World in Spain. Dr. Zakara sits on the advisory board of the Institute for Peace and uh, Diplomacy and advises the Institute on its Middle East program. Dr. Zakara, um, it's your turn for a statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction and for the invitation for, to, to participate in this uh, wonderful panel. Um, I agree with some of the things that they were mentioned uh, before. I think we had, uh, or I mean, the the world had high expectations about uh, Joe Biden, uh, having in mind what happened with the uh, Donald Trump presidency in the Middle East. But as uh, Barbara already mentioned, it seems that Biden is continuing this idea of the United States disengaging at least a little bit from the Middle East. I don't see that 100% clearly, but uh, we didn't see um, a dramatic change compared with the, with the, with the policy that Trump was uh, implemented in the Middle East, we see the continuation of uh, the United States support uh, uh, with Israel, mainly during these days, we are witnessing what is going on. Uh, very early, uh, we saw uh, that Biden was following this dual track on one side diplomacy with Iran trying to recover the JCPOA, but on the other hand, uh, making sure that they, they, they were providing signals attacking uh, some Iranian interest in, in Iraq. Uh, the region is also showing that the open conflicts that they existed before are not getting solved. Uh, we still have Afghanistan with the United States pulling out. We still have Yemen. We still have Syria. Just to mention only the ones on, there in the Middle East, uh, uh, which 
are uh, on, 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 on one hand uh, showing how important is uh, the provision of arms for the region, for all the parties to continue uh, their, their, their wars. On the other hand, we have some reasons that they are providing us hope for the future, at least for the short midterm. The end of the blockade in Qatar meant a lot for the region to solve some discrepancies, at least between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, reducing the tension. The conversations that Bart Kehan mentioned that they are taking place between the United States and Iran can, to some extent, uh, refloat the, the, the nuclear deal that was destroyed by, by Trump administration. Iran, Saudi, secret open conversations that they started a few weeks ago, that they, or, or at least that they were mentioned, they were um, released a few weeks ago, uh, are providing some ideas that more uh, detente in the region is possible between two main contenders in the region that at the end of the day were bringing the whole region to a very high level of tension that we almost reached uh, war in 2019. And despite the fact that uh, I personally don't, don't see that as a very positive development, the normalization between Israel and some Arab countries at least is reducing the tension within the Arab uh, context with Israel. Now we see this in the context that what is going on in Gaza lately, and we see that this it is having, of course, a negative impact on the Palestinian cause. But for some Arab countries, normalizing with Israel is helping them to improve their uh, international recognition uh, worldwide beyond the Arab uh, context. The problem is that despite all this somehow positive uh, trends or hopes we can have in the future, the damage was already done. Uh, in terms of military expenditures, the demand that was uh, um, uh, calculated by, by the CIPRI report is increasing and mainly in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, as uh, Dania mentioned, United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Turkey increased the demands of um, of, um, of uh, arms coming from not only from the United States but from other uh, possible partners like uh, providers like China, Russia, or other European uh, countries. And last but not least, since 2018 and since Trump administration started to uh, negotiate some kind of uh, nuclear technology transfer to Saudi Arabia, the idea of a nuclear uh, arms rates started to be discussed in the Middle East. In the middle of the, um, the United States um, uh, withdrawal from the JCPOA, this was very important. Now maybe Biden will change that trend, but as I said, the damage was already done. Uh, Iran um, withdraw gradually from some of the obligation of, from the JCPOA, and we still need to see if Iran will come back to that table of negotiation. But despite the fact that Iran still claims that they don't have any intention to have a nuclear war, a nuclear uh, uh, weapon, the, the suspicion is increasing in the region. And of course, this is raising the level of uh, distrust in the other uh, GCC states that can push for a, a, an armed, a nuclear arms race in the future. Then we leave this for, for the, for the Q&A uh, session if there are more things that we can discuss. Thank you very much for that. In fact, thank you all for those really insightful and timely opening statements. Uh, I did have to bring in some new additions to our agenda in light of the recent devastating crisis in the region that some, some of our panelists alluded to. I'm of course talking about the Israel-Gaza crisis. And before we kick off, just a note to the panelists, at any point, if you want to contribute or interject, please just that signal and I'll come to you. Barbara, let's start with you. Uh, here we are again, uh, and there is concern that this level of violence will continue unless weapon sales are halted to both sides. We're talking about Israel and Hamas. And this is very much uh, state-of-the-art precision weaponry. And of course, we know that the Joe Biden administration recently approved another potential sale of 735 million US dollars in weapons to Israel. And so that cycle continues. 
Yeah, well, this is part of a long-term uh, package that was actually negotiated by uh, the Obama administration with the Israelis, providing $3.8 billion worth of uh, US weaponry to Israel or military aid to Israel every year. Uh, some of this is, is, is essentially military aid to the US uh, military industrial complex since it's spent on American weapons or weapons that are jointly developed with the Israelis. Um, I mentioned Bernie Sanders effort. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that these arms sales are going to stop, but I think it's a wake up call for the Israelis that the arms uh, sales are even being questioned to the extent that they have been in the last few days. We've seen a number of uh, particularly progressive uh, democratic groups, um, which are increasingly strong in the Democratic Party, uh, saying, why is US taxpayer money going to provide lethal weaponry to Israel so that it can kill Palestinian civilians? Um, now, obviously, uh, the Israelis were responding to Hamas rockets, which are, are less, uh, less precise and have also done some damage. But nevertheless, the, the nature of the debate has changed in the United States. We also have seen a, a complete uh, drop in any enthusiasm for arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, big change since the Trump administration, partly because of Yemen, partly because of the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi. So I think at least in the United States, there is some sort of reconsideration of, of these arms sales. Uh, will others pick up the slack, the Russians, the Chinese? Possibly, but I think, uh, and, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Thaffer knows this better than me, there are legacy relationships where you can't just switch uh, suppliers because you have maintenance contracts, you have your personnel trained to use American uh, weaponry. And, and so if the attitude of the United States changes toward, toward blank checks and unlimited sales, um, I think we will see an impact. Also, many of these countries uh, can no longer afford these kinds of expenditures. Uh, they are seeing uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, that oil is not what it was. Uh, countries like Saudi Arabia have growing populations and difficulty uh, building a post-petroleum future for them. So there are some positive aspects, even as, even as I uh, uh, appreciate uh, what Luciano had to say about all the things that are going wrong and can go wrong. I, I still think there, there is some, there's some real rethinking um, in Washington about the nature of the U.S. involvement in the Middle East. Uh, rethinking, especially we're coming on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, rethinking of the, of the whole counterterrorism approach uh, to, to the region. And, uh, and of course, the threat, the major threat, uh, is now seen much more to be China, uh, at least in terms of, of a country, and, and climate change, frankly, and uh, pandemic diseases in terms of real threats to the American population. Uh, so the Middle East just doesn't, it just doesn't drag us in the way it did. Thank you for that, Barbara. And, and that brings me to Dr. Thaffer. Uh, can you tell us what impact this is having uh, on Arab-Israeli relations? I'm talking about the crisis in Israel and Gaza. Given that we know Saudi Arabia has led the course of condemnations against what it calls, quote, Israel's barbaric attacks. But I mean, on the other hand, are we still going to see um, these countries conveniently? I'm speaking about specifically uh, the UAE and Bahrain proceeding to purchase Israeli-made arms and defense technologies, given that um, the Abrams Accord is, of course, something that was clinched and very much in place? Well, uh, I think right now, uh, with regards to the Abraham Accords, I think the Arab states will likely lay low and uh, uh, try not to you know, uh, stir the pot, if you will. Uh, I think, um, the Arabs and the Arab people in general are very worked up about uh, the atrocities that are going on um, in, in uh, Israel and Palestine. And uh, this also proves that many of the surveys and polls that have been conducted um, in the Arab Gulf states that questioned, I think, uh, the role of the new generation, whether they have any sort of um, uh, attachment to the Pal Palestinian cause. 
And um, most of those surveys turned out to say that the youth generation is not really interested in the Palestinian cause, notably in, in probably the, the Gulf states that have less uh, freedom of speech. But when they polled Kuwait, which is the most democratic, if you will, in the Gulf, uh, it, it stated that uh, Kuwaitis were really um, still attached to the Palestinian cause and were moved by it. But as we saw these events turn, I think it shows that the Arab public's opinion about the issue really hasn't changed. And I think if it did change, this stoked a change in, in, in perception. But also, I would also, as there is the rise, rise of nationalism, there's also a rise of populism and anti-colonialism um, that's going on um, among uh, the Gulf states. And it's especially popular among the youth, the progressive mo movements. Actually, if you go in the Gulf, I think half the youth will cite Bernie Sanders. And so that also has had an effect on the perception of, of social justice and so I think that the uh, leaders in the Arab Gulf states are quite aware and vigilant of uh, the situation and are, uh, are sensitive to it. And I, I doubt that they will stir the pot right now. Thank you for those remarks. I think uh, Kehan, uh, we've been addressing the Israeli front and it's impossible to ignore weapons being smuggled reportedly from Iran to Hamas. Yes, it goes without saying, Barbara mentioned this earlier, this is uh, disproportionate, but it's still a collaboration that continues to threaten the region. Well, <clears throat> it is no secret that the Iranian government supports the Palestinian cause. And uh, to be honest, I think it's not just, just Iran's government, but the Iranian people also are very sympathetic about the Palestinian cause and they support that, this. The fact of the matter is that, you know, uh, from the Iranian perspective, the situation has changed. Uh, the situation has changed in the way that I described in my first point, that the technology and the way of battling the enemy on the ground has changed. And I think the more capability the local forces are getting, the more complication will come to the conflict. In this regard, I think the normalization of some Arab uh, countries with Israel uh, has somehow brings a kind of divisions amongst the Arab nations, because that will somehow transfer the Israeli regime from the center of geo geopolitical conflict of the region and make them a superior uh, actor on the Arab states, and this will bring uh, more extremism and division amongst the Arab nations. I think uh, not only the Iranians are, uh, you know, unsatisfied with this, and this will, of course, uh, will challenge the Turkish ambitions and ultimately, you know, uh, reactions by great powers. But at the same time, I think on the ground, uh, there is something that is not normal of this normalization of the uh, relations. And that's why we see these intense condemnations by the UAE and Saudi Arabia, because they cannot afford to, you know, answer their nations of this kind of aggressive, you know, actions by the Netanyahu regime in this regard. Therefore, on the Iranian side, I think the Iran is supporting that and it is proud for doing this. Uh, 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 not only Iran, but the Iranian, uh, you know, middle class, intellectual, academics, all of them are unhappy and are uh, very angry of uh, what is happening right now in the Gaza Strip. Therefore, I think the situation has somehow changed and we, we need to deal with the situation with a different look. Uh, I will just make a comment there and I'll come to Barbara very shortly. You mentioned something, Kehan, and I want to challenge that because um, especially over the recent years, um, as Iran's uh, economic situation has continued to deteriorate as a result of uh, the punitive measures from the US and the international community, uh, mismanagement within the country and corruption. Uh, Iranians um, are increasingly presenting us with their voices of di dissent and opposition. We've seen pockets of protests as you know full well, erupt across the country, though of course they have been dampened by um, the intensity of the security forces, saying no money to Gaza, 
No money to Syria, no money to Yemen, keep that for us, no money to Hezbollah. So what you're saying on an emotional level, I would say for a journalist that's been covering this country for well over a decade, on an emotional, uh, empathetic level, yes, the Iranians don't like what they're seeing happen in Gaza, but are they happy? that uh, the money that could be well used inside the country for themselves when they're running out of basic food items is being pumped into Hamas. I don't know if that's any longer the case. Um, certainly amongst, you mentioned the middle upper class, the educated, I, I would beg to differ there, if you'd like to respond. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it is not that the degree of the support is that much that you know goes in that way, I think. The Palestinian cause has a different the story of the Yemeni cause and other cause of causes in the region. That's uh, an entirely uh, different issue that has been with the Iranian for over 50 years. I think the case is absolutely different. In terms of the hardship, yes, it is. It is true that the Iranian are under uh, tremendous, you know, economic hardships, and they are dealing with that. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, recently and with the Trump administration withdrawing from the nuclear deal, the entire mentality of the Iranian has changed towards, uh, towards the West. And the way the government is trying to, some the Iranian government is trying to somehow connect its national security with its foreign presence. That is very important that the Supreme Leader of Iran is arguing that uh, for, uh, you know, preempting the threat, we need to be uh, active in the regional affairs. So the issue of, you know, Israeli and Palestinian cause is also related to the issue of resistance access that we call. Uh, and that is a strategic and geopolitical, you know, reason for the Iran national security. So defending that is also related to defending the survival of the state of Iran in its geopolitical you know, context. Therefore, we have ideological context and geopolitical context. And I think the issue is absolutely different now when it goes to the Palestinian issue. I'm going to take a very brief comment from Barbara before we go to Yeah, you. I, I basically just wanted to say what you said, <laughs> Sanam, that I have I have heard a lot of complaints from Iranians over the years about uh, support for issues like the Palestinian cause. Uh, one other point also though, is that Hamas um, has had its differences with Iran. It also has a lot of capabilities that it's built up. Uh, apparently a lot of these rockets are homemade. They're no longer being provided by uh, Iran. So even if Iran were to stop its support of Hamas, it probably would not change uh, what we just saw. That's all. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Luciana, would you like to add anything to the Hamas-Israel crisis before we move on to uh, Saudi-Iran negotiations? No, no, no. We, we, I mean, no, no, the only thing I can say is that I agree to some extent with what it was said, but of course it's difficult to, to collect uh, a very clear picture about the public opinion in Iran. We always have a lot of uh, surveys um, uh, conducted inside Iran about what the people think about foreign policy issues and some service conducted from abroad. I mean, the, I mean, what I always do is to compare both and to have to, to try to have an average opinion. But of course, there are complaints about what Iran is spending abroad. But on the other hand, there are a lot of there is a lot of support for some of the causes. I mean, we can see that uh, daily on a daily basis following Twitter, uh, people that supposedly they are not pro-governmental, and however, they are still supporting. Uh, that so it, this was a short comment I wanted to, to mention. Thank you, Luciano. Um, I will move on to a topic that I think every single panelist uh, mentioned in their opening statement. You know, we've been following the Iran uh, Saudi Arabia talks, uh, which are aimed at obviously reducing regional tensions. And this is again, I'm going to come back to you, Kehan. What palpable steps do you see Tehran taking given that it has reiterated time and time again? that its ballistic missile program is non-negotiable, it's off the table. And of course, this, while keeping in mind that the KSA's annual military expenditure, and I think Dr. Thafa can correct me if I'm wrong, is some five times higher than that of Iran's. Oh, yes, indeed. It is non-negotiable. I, I think no country would do that. I think in terms of, you know, national defense production, in terms of national prestige, in terms of 
Iran's deterrent power in terms of people's support for continuing this. Uh, I do not see any, uh, you know, possibility of Iran's negotiating on that. As I mentioned, this is a uh, this is related to the Iranian deterrent, you know, as trends. Uh, in the time of insecurity, and the Iranians are proud of this, are praying these missiles for the defensive matter, of course. Therefore, I think bringing any, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, negotiations on this matter will entirely kill any, you know, other negotiations uh, of the Iranian side on the regional issues or uh, other issues. Uh, that's why I think the American realized that uh, they should not go in that regard for the first place. As I mentioned, I think the uh, regional issues is something that Iran will talk on that because Iran has the uh, strength of and the confidence building that cannot lose on the ground because it has the field influence. But when it goes to the missiles issue, I do not see any prospect for this talk. I, I do not think any country would do that. Therefore, uh, I have always mentioned that that is a red line and that is a red line for the domestic politics and the different forces inside Iran will, uh, you know, uh, derail any kind of negotiations uh, goes going in that, that part. It doesn't matter that the Iranian presidential elections going to the hardliner or moderator. Some issues are strategic issues that the state is not willing to do that. I think the missile issue is completely with different potentials and nature. And Dr. Thafar, uh, Riyadh is fully aware of this as these negotiations continue, right? Yes, but uh, as you're aware and everyone is aware that this is a negotiation, so everyone is going to use whatever leverage they can to get the most they can walk away with. Um, given that, I think that, uh, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia has certain issues that are a priority to Saudi Arabia and Iran may have certain issues. I think both are, are struggling uh, regionally. Uh, Saudi Arabia is struggling with the war in Yemen. Um, in Iraq, uh, Iran is losing a lot of popularity. There's a lot of uh, disenchantment towards Iran and Iraq and Syria. I think the Russians are considering maybe pushing out the Iranians in the long term. So I think there's a lot of room for negotiation, maybe on the regional front. Um, uh, for Yemen, uh, it's definitely, in my opinion, it's uh, probably uh, a kind of a low-hanging fruit um, in comparison to the other conflicts. Um, and it has been reported that it was the topic, the main to one of the main topics of discussion um, in Baghdad. Uh, so resolving the Yemen conflict is of high importance to Saudi. Um, and it, it, it is believed that Riyadh is asking uh, Tehran to withdraw support uh, for the Houthis. Um, and although the Iranians have supported the Houthis, I think that Iran has few stakes in Yemen. Uh, Yemen is more than a thousand miles away um, from Tehran and separated by multiple uh, land and sea borders, which makes it, I think, more of an acceptable uh, concession um, than other conflicts. So uh, my gathering, you know, is Iran wants to solve the Yemen conflict in a way that will ensure the Houthis have a power sharing role in the government. Um, and Iran also wants Saudi Arabia to back off its uh, pressure campaign uh, to remove Iranian uh, proxies in Iraq and Syria and stop, stop the lobbying of sanctions against Iran. Um, and I'm not an expert per se on Iran, but I think that you know, Yemen is probably low hanging fruit um, with that regard for both parties. Now, in reference to your, your question about what can be on the table, if we go back to 1998 through 2001, there was, there was a pact between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, and part of the reason the pact happened was uh, there was a new president, Khatami, if I pronounced him correctly. Uh, he was uh, viewed to be, I guess, a little bit more moderate uh, than, than the others. And the Saudis thought it was a good opportunity to have uh, negotiations there. And it worked out, but, uh, and they did call it a, a security pact, but really it was more related to soft confidence building measures um, 
uh, related to uh, trade, uh, flights between the two countries, cooperation against drug trafficking, uh, power gen working together on power generating sectors, technical scientific issues and whatnot. So I think on a more practical course, that's probably where these negotiations should also consider uh, starting. Hey, Han, you wanted to make a quick point there. Yes. Yes, I wanted to say that the missile issue is in nature is not the Saudis problem. I think that the problem with the Saudis is that the missiles are not transferring to the militia forces in, in Yemen, for instance, which I think Iran is ready to negotiate on that for the sake of bringing regional stability. The Iranian official made this very clear. They are ready to do that. I think the missile issue is something that is being constructed by the Israelis. It's not a Saudi issue. It is very new in the negotiations that has overwhelmed the, the, the other regional issues, uh, you know, and the, the talking on other regional issues. And I, I think it's a pretext that is made by the Israelis, not the Saudis. I wanted to say that. Thank you, uh, Kehan. Please go ahead, Luciano. Yeah, just to, to follow up with uh, Kehan said, I think since the very beginning of the Yemeni conflict in 2015, we, we, we were conducting track two dialogues in Qatar between uh, Iranians and, and members from the GCC. And then the, the first thing that they mentioned is uh, Iranian real or symbolic support to, to, to Houthis uh, in Yemen as a bargain chip to reduce the tension between Saudi and Iran. So we know this since the very beginning. And we have been stuck on this uh, issue. And I, I agree with, the, with, with Kehan. I assume that the main concern for the Saudis in these negotiations or the renegotiation of the JCPA is not 100% related to uh, the ballistic missile program, but with the support uh, to the Yemenis, uh, that this is always the main concern or has been the main concern, security concerns for, for the Saudis since 2015 or maybe since much longer uh, before. Uh, that said, I think that the HOPE initiative uh, from November 2019 uh, from the Iranian side, to some extent acknowledged the security concerns of the GCC states. And on, on that regard, I think that this is something that uh, Rouhani administration should push a little bit more before the, they finish their, uh, his second term because we don't know what the next president will do in terms of uh, uh, constructive engagement with the GCC states. But uh, I think that if this um, uh, I mean, an acknowledgement of security concerns of the GCC states is not included in Yemen and Iran is not taking uh, decisive action regarding that, it would be very difficult to um, create confidence, at least with Saudi Arabia, which is the main, the main issue in, in uh, Iran-GCC relations. Thank you, Luciana. I want to move on to Barbara again, if we can. Uh, Barbara, uh, continuing with this discussion of negotiations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, we know that this, uh, we can call it a wall of mistrust between the two. It's propelled what looks like an escalating arms race between the two countries. You know, we know that Saudi Arabia, for its part, has been advancing its uh, civilian nuclear program. What role do you think, or how can the US and its partners play a part in helping to claim some sort of an agreement that eases tensions between the two rivals? You mentioned something earlier, reduction in arms sales. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, well, first, just a, just a point of clarification. The, um, the agreement that was negotiated under the Hatami administration followed uh, the Kobar Towers bombing of 1996, which uh, killed 19 American airmen and was blamed on a supposedly Iranian backed Saudi Shia terrorist group. Um, so this was quite a shock. Uh, and uh, the Saudis in fact did not cooperate very much with the United States in the investigation of that bombing, but they did begin rather urgent security talks uh, which were led by Hassan Rouhani, of all people, and Hussein Mousavian, another uh, familiar name for many of us. 
Um, so this is what led to that that understanding. And there was a there was a, a tacit agreement that they would no longer support subversion in each other's countries. Uh, so on the Saudi side, that would mean support for Arab ethnic groups, for Sunnis in Balochistan who'd been carrying out terrorist attacks and have carried out terrorist attacks on uh, Iranian forces. So I think there's room for, for that sort of thing. What I meant about the arms sales is that the Biden administration doesn't have the same appetite and certainly Congress doesn't have the same appetite for continuing to sell lots and lots of weapons to Saudi Arabia or for the United or to the United Arab Emirates, uh, for that matter, probably also to Qatar. So I would foresee that this will this will come down. Also, these countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, don't have the money for these systems anymore. So I think that phase of of uh, is over. And Iran has always said that uh, it relies on itself. It doesn't rely on others and it's kind of lampooned the uh, GCC states, particularly Saudi Arabia, uh, for suggesting that it can purchase security from outside the region uh, in the form of weapons or in the form of US troops. Um, and I think that's obviously still the, the Iranian position. Um, I was in another discussion a couple of days ago and Ali Vayez from the International Crisis Group had a very good idea about I mean, obviously we're seeing bilateral talks and I think that's the beginning for de-escalation, but that eventually some sort of forum, not so much the hope idea, but perhaps the GCC plus Iran and Iraq with support from the United Nations could begin to talk about some of these, um, these issues and reach some agreements, some confidence building measures. No, Iran isn't going to give up its missiles, but it might legislate a 2000 kilometer limit on the range of those missiles it might agree to advance warning for missile tests, um, these kinds of things. And there might be a regional agreement on limiting range of missiles and also on uh, providing advance warning of missile tests. There also can be agreements on nuclear issues, uh, limits on, on possession of uh, uranium enriched above a certain percent, um, even possibly some talk about, uh, about producing fuel at a at a fuel bank that would be shared by all of these states, either located in the region or outside. So I think, I think you know, if we can begin down this road, there are many good things that can flow from it. And the United States role is to support this and to encourage its traditional partners in the region to engage in these discussions, to support these kinds of actions by the United Nations, um, by the GCC, by Iraq, et cetera. Barbara, I have a, a brief question to ask you before I take a question from the Q&A that's been uh, sent over to us. Um, we knew that essentially um, the US um, was, the Trump administration, the previous administration was pursuing a wider deal on sharing US, US nuclear power technology with Saudi Arabia. Is that something that's um, likely to continue under the current administration, under Joe Biden? No way. <laughs> No way. And my understanding, I, I think, is that the, the Saudis have been seeking South Korean technology. Uh, but of course, the U.S. has a lot of influence over South Korea uh, and, and so can affect whatever Saudi Arabia gets. And, and there have been complaints that Saudi Arabia has not been fully open with the International Atomic Energy Agency about some of its nuclear activities. Uh, and so I am I'm sure the United States will will support efforts by the IAEA to hold Saudi Arabia to to account. It's it's a new day. Um, uh, you know, the the view of Saudi Arabia has changed so dramatically um, in the United States in the last few years. And and the Trump administration, by embracing Mohammed bin Salman, actually did him no favor because now there's a tremendous backlash against that. Thank you, Barbara. I now have a question that's been sent over to us, anonymous, and um, whoever wants to can take that. China has recently signed a 25-year strategic partnership with Iran and forged other partnerships with Saudi Arabia and Israel. How do you think the US needs to react to these partnerships or realign its relationships with major regional powers in the Middle East? Who would like to take that? Am I gonna pick one of you here? Barbara, please go ahead. <laughs> it's the US angle, so. Uh, you know, why me again? Look, a lot has been written about this and, and my co can also deal with it. 
I think there was a lot of hype. Uh, it was an agreement similar to the sorts of agreements that China has with every other major country in that part of the world. Um, and the Iranians wanted it to show that they could resist sanctions pressure and that they didn't need sanctions relief, uh, you know, and, but even, I mean, to, to properly benefit from this agreement, uh, Iran still needs sanctions relief, frankly. Um, so I think, I think there was, it was, it was more hype than, than reality, but maybe Kehan has some thoughts on that and wants to contradict me. Kehan? Yes, I think, uh, yes, yes. Of course, we had this uh, intense debate inside Iran's domestic politics, and it was in the middle of no rules. There were no, uh, you know, commentators and, uh, you know, a lot of satellite TV made a lot of negative comments on that. But for me, it goes in three ways. First, it is good for Iran's, you know, diplomacy. The expansion of diplomacy is good for Iran. And I think this goes in this context that the, uh, the moderate government is trying to uh, you know, conduct its foreign policy in a diversifying way. So that is good for expansion of diplomacy uh, uh, on the time that uh, the Western side is uncertain. And, and, and we had in that time, the nuclear negotiations in a very uh, weak situation. The second issue is the fact that China is everywhere in the Middle East, and it goes to Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Iran. You know the same, you know, comprehensive agreement that Chinese are doing, and that goes to the fact that the Chinese, uh, while their economic growth are, you know, growing at the same time, they would like to get more political role in the region, and I think for diversification of the political equation. Uh, especially in the Persian Gulf, it is good because Iran is also supporting that uh, to somehow uh, deny or somehow weaken the U.S. hegemonic ambition in the region by bringing other action, actors like China, Russia, Turkey, India, other factors. It is good for the region to have this diversification in the regional equation. So for Iran, it has economic cause and at the same time political and you know, geostrategic cause as well. So it's a positive thing that the Iranian have done this. So we should not be afraid of that. Perhaps America is that, but I do not see that European countries are afraid that much of the way that the US is seeing that. Thank you, Kehan. Please go ahead, Luciana. And just, yeah. I need to make a point before um, you take the mic, Luciana. We don't have a great deal of time left. So if I can ask the panelists to, um, keep their responses a little bit more uh, restrained. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Go ahead. Since the question was uh, asking what the United States, United States should do, actually, I don't think they should do anything because the main concern for the United States with this 25-year agreement is if the military aspect was included. And as uh, Kehan uh, mentioned, there were many rumors about what was included in that. And we saw that since the the arms embargo against Iran was lifted. Everybody was expecting that the Chinese will sell, would sell a lot of arms to Iran. And this did not happen. And it's very unlikely that it's going to happen. So I, I don't think, I mean, it's a, basically a commercial uh, agreement that Iran signed with Korea, South Korea, Japan, India. Uh, I don't think the United States needs to react in a military way as a threat coming from, from China involving in Iran. Yeah, we will come back to the uh, China issue uh, very briefly, but before we do, uh, uh, Luciano, I want to stay on this topic. What, in terms of Saudi Arabia advancing its own program, how do you think US allies in the region, I'm talking about, let's say, Turkey and Israel, for example, that we mentioned earlier, are going to respond to this ongoing development? You know, there are some fears that Saudi Arabia's pursuit of nuclear program, again, that can accelerate this arms race that we're also concerned about talking about today. I mean, as I mentioned before, I mean, since 2018, there are concerns about the, this arm, uh, arms race, uh, nuclear arms race uh, in the region again. I mean, Iran is still uh, pushing for the nuclear arms free zone in the region since the 80s. Uh, this is an idea that was recovered by Ahmadinejad, but uh, Hatami, by Rouhani. Uh, so on the Iranian side, despite the 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 dangerous uh, track that the JCPOA, uh, the, the failure of the JCPOA was uh, driving to, 
there is a still an idea that Iran doesn't want to reach uh, or, or to uh, uh, acquire nuclear weapons, but the transfer of technology that was agreed with Trump administration uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia in 2018 was directly driving to that. There was a report from the Congress saying that this was uh, against the non-proliferation treaty, uh, something that um, we cannot say about Iran specifically. Uh, of course, once, once you have one country that in the Middle East that is reaching a deterrence capability in nuclear terms, other countries would like to, do, to have at least a know-how. Saudi Arabia already tried to do that, to uh, acquire the same technology that Iran tried to acquire from Pakistan in the 80s and 90s. So it wouldn't be a surprise that other countries would try to do the same. And, and that's a good point for me to bring in uh, Dr. Thafa to the discussion. Uh, Saudi Arabia, we know, has a limited uh, safeguards agreement with the IAEA, with the international agency. And it's not really signed up to the same restrictions to nuclear proliferation as other countries have. Is there any way that it can be given incentives to be encouraged to do this? Well, ironically, although uh, Saudi Arabia is not very excited about the JCPOA, I do think if, if the JCPOA the agreement for the JCOP is uh, is the U.S. actually enters back into the agreement. I think that um, that there would be a more forceful logic to have Saudi um, first of all uh, allow uh, international agencies and the IEA to have uh, more access to their nuclear facilities and a justification for the U.S. to pressure the Saudis. Uh, into that as well. I think right now, uh, although um, Secretary Blinken has mentioned it in January that they would like to relent the Saudis and all their partners and allies on the same page, I find it interesting that um, when negotiations are going on um, for the JC JCPOA, uh, the U.S. kind of turns a blind eye to the parties that are upset about the JCPOA and sort of offers concessions. And I think that's how kind of the Yemen war was green lighted. And so this conversation about uh, nuclear proliferation or not, I think is probably a little bit more quiet down while the negotiations move forward. But if the US enters back in the JCPOA, I find that the US is gonna go ahead and, and pressure Saudi in my opinion. Dr. Fafa, while I have you here, I have another question for you. You know, the White House recently decided to continue its review of the Trump administration's sale of F-35 uh, fighter jets to the UAE. If that's fulfilled, what sort of an impact is that going to have, that sale on, again, arms race, a topic that we're talking about in the region? Well, of course, you know, more arms uh, will contribute to the arms race in the region. Um, the, the, the sale does have the power. Uh, to change the balance of power in the region um, by giving uh, the UAE Air Force a significant edge um, and make it one of the most powerful countries in the Middle East, aside from Israel. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar have both expressed interest um, in the F-35 jet jets, but interestingly, the Saudis requested uh, to purchase it, um, but they have not received a response. So uh, there's kind of this, perspective that there's a favoring of the UAE over Saudi regarding the F-35 sales. And some have explained it as um, the UAE is a fighting partner uh, of the Pentagon in, in some conflicts. But in actuality, I, I think it is due to its normalization with Israel, um, technically an award for the move. Um, and so the deterrence capabilities of the F-35 um, in Emirati hands can provide a sense of safety for, for, for uh, uh, UAE, especially that it's concerned about Iran. However, um, I mean, maybe this will incentivize uh, others to, to attain more weapons. And, um, and I think it will continue on growing the arms race in the Middle East. Barbara, I'm going to come back to you, um, uh, seeming as we're on the topic of, uh, and we were previously, discussions between Saudi Arabia and Iran. We know that uh, Joe Biden made a pledge earlier this year to stop 
US support for offensive operations in Yemen. But as it was mentioned by both Kehan and Dr. Thafer, local forces are getting more and more arms. Violent clashes are continuing between the both sides, the Saudi-led coalitions, the Houthi rebels. The country is experiencing the world's worst humanitarian crisis. We hear that line time and time again. What else does Washington need to do here to return to diplomacy, to try and play peacemaker at least, so that Biden delivers on those pledges and promises? Well, one of the first things Joe Biden did was appoint a Yemen envoy, uh, team, uh, Tim Lenderking, a very experienced diplomat. And he's been shuttling around the Middle East, uh, trying to, to reach some agreements. I think the problem now is really with the Houthis who feel that they are very much on the winning side and are trying to take over more territory before they will call, call a halt. The other problem, of course, is that Yemen is divided north-south. Um, it doesn't have a coherent opposition to the Houthis, their, their factions. So, uh, you know, I think that the only, the only solution will probably be some sort of ceasefire and a very loose federal system that would give a lot of autonomy to these different, uh, these different groups. Um, and there needs to be an end to the blockade of Yemen so that humanitarian supplies can, can come in uh, easily. Um, but uh, the Houthis are not stopping the fighting, unfortunately. Um, and there are peace proposals on the table and they're not accepting them. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Earlier, we were speaking about, of course, uh, China, and I'm coming to you now, uh, Kehan, if I may. Uh, do you think that um, these are obviously both um, allies of Iran, that countries like China, like Russia, they can somehow start playing some sort of a role in mitigating the armed race in the region? You know, some observers are saying that Moscow and Beijing may end up actually increasing their arms exports as the U.S. is trying to scale down its military presence in the region, in the Middle East? Well, that's clear that the Russian style is to export arms in the region, and that's the main income of the Russian economy, plus, you know, exporting nuclear technology and, uh, you know, gas and, uh, you know, energy export. That is something that the Russian count on that, and they are selling arms at the same time to all countries in the region, and, and they are very uh, focused on that. But the issue is that, uh, you know, we might think that the future of war in the region is not necessarily on conducting conventional war or the war coming uh, out of the uh, weapons accumulation in a conventional way. I think the future of war in the region is based more on proxy wars and based on cyber wars, intelligence wars, and other technology of war that are emerging from the complication of the conflict in the region. Therefore, uh, that is very much important. And we need to somehow think that the Russian and the Chinese are not, uh, in a way, involved in this kind of war. But, at the, uh, but uh, while that, you know, the Western countries are uh, against, for instance, of transferring technology of, you know, uh, uh, weapons to a country like Iran, then the Iran has no, uh, the Iranians have no choice to go to the Russians and the Chinese. Of course, uh, but Luciano mentioned that the Chinese issue in terms of military uh, arms transfer is more complicated. But when it goes to Iran-Russian relations, it has uh, uh, an over thirty years uh, relations of weapon transfer, and it is the traditional base of Iran and Russia relations. And the Russians have never stopped, uh, you know, sending, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated, uh, you know, uh, arms uh, technology to Iran. Therefore, this business will stay on the Russian side, but I'm not sure about the Chinese side. Uh, you mentioned Luciano, so I'm gonna uh, come to you briefly, if I may, you know, we're talking about uh, the military withdrawal from Afghanistan and ongoing talks in Washington over this potential uh, departure of U.S. troops from Iraq. Are there concerns, would you say, would you agree that the Russian and the Chinese will strengthen their uh, military presence in the region? Actually, I, I don't think so. Uh, as uh, Kehan mentioned, Russia is interested in, in exporting arms, but not, I mean, with the exception of Syria, they are not interested in uh, engaging militarily in the region, neither are the Chinese. This is what I mentioned before. I mean, there were a lot of rumors about 
this 25 year would mean that China will, would have a base, a military base in Iran. This was totally denied. And nobody wants to have a military uh, Chinese base in the region. And this would be real, uh, a real change in the region, having a military presence from Russia or China. The region would uh, increase the insecurity uh, in the region because, I mean, more uh, actors would be involved and actors that they have a more clear agenda. It's not the same having a, a Turkish uh, base or a military uh, group here in, in Qatar uh, because the interests of Turkey in, in the region are not the same that the interests that Russia and China would have or even the military power that both uh, powers uh, would have. Uh, uh, the fact that Russia and China can be alternative suppliers for gun, for arms, for the GCC says and Iran doesn't mean that they would be military or politically military or strategic involved in the region. I, I don't think that there's any interest for any GCC state plus Iran to engage with uh, Russia and China in that way. Thank you. I'm just gonna take a moment to take a question from the Q&A. We have a few. I've been told not to mention names because we can't verify them. So we have one with regional rapprochement becoming a possibility again. How will labels regarding the status of hybrid actors figure into regional security dialogues, especially with respect to uh, the terrorist organization label mirroring Hezbollah, Hamas, and even uh, the Revolutionary Guards Corps? I suppose, um, Kehan, would you be interested in taking that? Well, uh uh i'm not uh, i'm not sure i agree with this kind of comment because uh, i see these groups uh, more of defenders of uh, their uh, you know countries uh, or defender of their own sake or at the same time justify justifying their acts for you know uh, battling the occupation forces whether it is Hashd al Shabi, Hezbollah, or Husi. So I see it in this way, in a more uh, defensive way to the matter of survival when it goes to, uh, you know, call them. So uh, I disagree with this kind of, uh, you know, definition. But at the same time, I think when, when the cause of the threats are removed in the time of insecurity for these groups, then the state supports for these groups will go in a different way. For instance, uh, when it goes to Iran, uh, when the cause of uh, insecurity in the time of insecurity, which is right now for, uh, is, uh, is a strong for Iran, the survival of the state of Iran, then, then the domestic politics of Iran cannot be easily justify of this kind of relations in the future. So the issue is that how far Iran's, uh, you know, support of these groups should go in the time of stability, not in the time of insecurity. That is a different case. So we should think of this way in this context in the future. Thank you, Kehan. I'm going to extend our talk if everyone agrees for a little bit longer, but I will be very strict. You're only allowed one minute each for the responses. <laughs> I'm going to be tough with you now. Um, I think it's a good time for us to address um, uh, the withdrawal of troops um, from the region. You know, the 2003 invasion of Iraq really created this power vacuum that in part, we can say, contributed to the rise of the Islamic State group in Iraq and Syria. Critics argue that the Obama administration's withdrawal from Iraq allowed for the terrorist organization to take over large swathes of the country. Similarly today, you've got extremist groups and they are potentially standing to benefit from uh, US withdrawal from Afghanistan and a potential departure from Iraq. Who wants to take this? How can the Biden administration strike a balance here? Because it needs to fulfill its promise to end regional interventions, but still prevent the resurgence of extremist groups. Who would like to take that? It's gonna to have to be Barbara if no one's putting their hands up. <laughs> I was afraid of that. Uh, look, these groups are not going away. They're not going away. Um, and I think the Biden administration is going to do its best to try to focus on whatever perceived threats there are to American personnel and to the US homeland. Uh, and for the rest, I, it's going to rely on the region to some extent. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm old enough to remember when the U.S. and Iran were working together. 
actually they've done it twice. They did it against uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda initially in, in 2001, 2002, and then against ISIS in Iraq in 2004, five, uh, 15, 16. Um, they're going to have to be tacit arrangements uh, with local forces on the ground. U.S. will keep its relationship, I think, with the Kurds in Syria, that they are our main uh, partner in dealing with any kind of ISIS resurgence. Uh, and uh, we'll work with the Iraqi security forces to the extent possible, also the Kurds probably in, in Iraq as well, to try to keep an eye on, on ISIS there. Uh, Afghanistan Af Afghanistan is going to be tougher. It's definitely going to be tougher. And um, we really, uh, you know, the, there's major concern that it will really devolve into civil conflict between the government forces and the Taliban. And of course, ISIS uh, and uh, Al Qaeda will benefit from, from whatever chaos and insecurity is there. And that's going to have security implications for Iran as well. So I have no good answers for that, I'm afraid. But um, you know, the U.S. has had it with on the ground, with boots on the ground, in most of these places. It's going to try to find other ways, whether through drones, uh, you know, uh, various uh, various cyber techniques, whatever, uh, to deal with these groups, but not with boots on the ground. Thank you, Barbara. I'm going to pose one more question before I ask for. Uh, a conclusive answer from all of you and anyone but Barbara can take that we've been throwing so many questions at her um, you know when the US invaded Iraq it at the time saw the country as this potential cornerstone of Middle Eastern stability it even engaged with Iran on what a post Saddam Hussein government would look like does anyone here do any of the panelists think that we're likely to see a similar coordination and engagement once the US decides to pull troops out of Afghanistan, which Barbara mentioned will be more challenging and Iraq this time around. Who would like to take that? I see a big smile on Luciana's face and Kehan. Okay. You can have a minute each before we go to the conclusive remarks. I mean, maybe Kehan would disagree because I, I remember his previous answer, but I think that the, this will depend on the 18th June election, election in Iran. Uh, I think that the willingness of any uh, Iranian administration to collaborate with the United States can de will depend on who will be the, the, the next Iranian president. We saw that there was an interest from Rouhani administration. We saw for the first time the American and Iranian flag together in a picture between Kerry and Sarif. Uh, this picture will be very unlikely to, to, to happen again in signing one deal, depending on who is the next uh, president. The same that any collaboration in, uh, in, in, in Afghanistan, which I agree with uh, Barbara, is a very complicated uh, security concern for, for Iran, depending on how the, the negotiations are, are going. And it's the main security concern for Iran. Thank you, Kehan. Do you agree that the, there will be such a dramatic shift in Iran's foreign policy in light of the presidential elections coming up in June? No, I do not think that the president elections has anything to do with the strategic issues of Iran's regional policy. I agree. The with fact you. of the matter is that the uh, Iran and the U.S. have a strategic discrepancies in the region. Uh, never a regional power would like to see a big, a big hostile superpower uh, across its national border. And it is a fact. I think the Iran-U.S. relations is beyond ideological or attitude relations. It is a geopolitical, you know, discrepancy as conflict that uh, day by day is going more when it goes to the regional issues. Never China and Russia settled their issues with the United States, unless the United States gets out of its hegemonic ambitions from the region and, and lets the other uh, you know, actors be part of the regional equation. The US does not accept this, it still thinks that it is the only superpower that has the right and responsibility to do whatever it wants. So far as this kind of equation exists, no country would do that. Even I think Saudi Arabia one day will, will be against the US, you know, uh, this kind of presence, uh, if it is not, you know, dependent on the, uh, you know, US security umbrella one day. 
Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to take a moment with all of you now because we're fast approaching the end of our panel. And I'd like Dr. Thafer to start off by uh, telling us what she thinks, what role international organizations, think tanks can play in containing this ongoing arms race in the region, if indeed there is anything that they can do. Dr. Thafer, please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I had a couple of points that I actually wanted to make, and this could be related to, to think tanks as well and, and whatnot. I mean, um, I can see why Iran says that it wants the US to withdraw, but I, I think at the same time, uh, the Gulf states see that they would lose a lot of leverage with the US withdrawal. So, you know, it, it seems like, you know, there's not the same common interest when it comes to that regard. Nonetheless, I would like to, to, to take a step back and look at like a broader picture that I think is missed in, in, in many of these panels. And it's the fact that we really need to think about redefining our national security to consider human security. Um, and I think many of the problems that are going on here are not, we're, we're just talking about how to fix the issue with a Band-Aid rather than the, than the root causes. For example, um, the refugee crisis has really, is interrelated to the rise of nationalism, which is interrelated to the rise of ethnic cleansing and violence and all that we're witnessing, even here in the capital at Washington. So I think terrorism is also interrelated to some of the policies that has caused so much human insecurity um, out there. And I think that that's also something important and the arms race has contributed to that. So I think that you know, we need to, to start having panels more about the root causes of these issues. And, and I, I actually, you know, at Gulf International Forum, we have these kind of panels all the time, so I'm not criticizing you. But I'm just saying that it is important to, to, to think about uh, human security as a national security issue. I think it would resolve the root causes of, of, of many problems that we're witnessing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thafer. I'd like to pose the same question to Luciana, if you can. Yeah, well, I, I actually, uh, I totally agree with the, with, with the Dr. Safer. Uh, since the COVID uh, crisis started, uh, we had many, many workshops and, and discussions about that. I always emphasize the need to uh, focus on the human security because we realized that in the, basically in the region, in the GCC, that the human capital is the most important capital that we have in the region. And any discussions about security in the region that is not included in the population uh, will not solve any problem in the region. And this includes uh, military issues and uh, strategic issues. Uh, if the main uh, focus is the uh, borders and not the people that is within the borders, um, I mean, we, we will not reach any, any security arrangement that will guarantee the security of the whole nation. Uh, that I think this is the main the main issue here. Uh, and the initiative that they should raise in the region should include people rather than borders or, or, or ruling elites uh, in the region. Thank you, Luciano. Uh, Kehan, the floor is yours. I just, uh, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, in terms of the US presence, I, I think that the Iranians have accepted the reality that the U.S. presence is a reality. I, they do not want to completely, you know, expel the U.S. out of the region. The problem is that the U.S. is is traditionally calling itself the dominant trends in the Persian Gulf, and the Iranians are trying to somehow protect their uh, defense, uh, uh, protect their, you know, interests by strengthening their positions. And I tell you that the the Iranian strengthening of its Navy is not just tackling the U.S. Navy strength. It is just arguing, uh, being arguing that uh, this is the place that uh, is related to Iran's internal security. And we must be there because this is some, somewhere that it goes to our domestic security. I mean, the northern part of the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. And it has nothing to do with the other regional countries like Saudi Arabia, like the, the, the Indian that has accepted the fact of the Chinese element in the Indian Ocean after years of years. So the Iranians are realizing that the US is a reality on the region, but they are trying to somehow diversifying 
this reality to not getting to the dominant trend in the region. Thank you, Kehan. And last but not least, Barbara, please go ahead. Sure, very briefly. I don't think the US wants to be the hegemon there anymore. <laughs> um, and I think that we've seen a real uh, pivot toward diplomacy uh, on the part of the Biden administration. My hope would be that if we can get back into the JCPOA, if the sanctions can be lifted, that the perception of the United States in Iran will, will change, that the government in Iran will not see the United States as the same sort of threat as it did when we had Mike Pompeo and his 12 demands and, and a very thinly disguised regime change policy. Um, and, you know, there is this theory, and I don't know, we'll see, uh, that if there's a consolidation of political forces in Iran be, behind the so-called hardliners, uh, that it will be easier for Iran actually to adopt a less hostile policy toward the United States and vice versa. Uh, because it won't worry about, uh, about uh, factional uh, attacks. Uh, this is something that will be tested. Um, I think we're going to get a conservative president in Iran uh, who will be a face to the outside world. We will not have another Ahmadinejad with all his craziness. And so this, this will be something that we can, can test. On the U.S. side, U.S. does not want any more military confrontations and will do its best, I think, to de-escalate. Barbara, you know more than the rest of us how unpredictable those elections in Iran prove to be. Let's see, let's see who gets it. I'm afraid uh, that brings us to the end of this really uh, wonderful dynamic panel discussion. And I'd like to thank our speakers, Barbara Slavin, Kehan Barzagar, Luciano Zakara, and uh, Dania Fafer for sharing your insights with us. It's been extraordinary. And, a massive thanks to the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, Yunus and Bijan for inviting me to moderate this timely discussion. Uh, please stay tuned. Apparently the keynote address coming up is by Dr. William Ruger, Vice President for Research and Policy at the Charles Koch Institute on the topic of US withdrawal from Afghanistan, which we briefly touched on, uh, which begins at 1.45 PM. That's in 15 minutes time. Thank you all so much for being with us during this discussion. Thank you. Thank you.